Hi, and thank you for joining today on the first day of the Spectators Alternative Conference. Um, I'm not sure what number event we are on at this point, so I'm going to give up trying to say that. Um, but what I can say is this panel today is brought to you not just by the Spectator, but by our sponsor for today's discussion, MSD, the global pharmaceutical leader. So thank you to MSD for sponsoring today's discussion and making it possible. Um, the topic, the NHS in a COVID-19 world. And Clearly, as we've seen in every single discussion in this conference so far, coronavirus has impacted so many parts of our lives. Um, but I suppose one of the most direct areas is clearly healthcare. Now, in the first wave of coronavirus, um, steps were taken by the government, by the NHS, to ensure that the health service was not overwhelmed. And there was success there. We saw the creation of the Nightingale hospitals, uh, not all used, but the space in case they had to be. Um, but while the NHS was not overwhelmed, I think it's fair to say that if we look at um, what happened in the UK, the fact we are among the highest death tolls in Europe, um, we are at a point where shortcomings in our healthcare system, also just you know the way government functions and uh, so forth, were exposed in the process. So as we head into what Boris Johnson has described as a second wave, uh, what lessons have been learned? And also looking a little bit further ahead as we reach further on this discussion, what future pandemics do we need to worry about? And lots of people don't think this is, you know, the last we're going to have from that. So do we need to be having other preparations, not just for type coronavirus type of pandemics, but influenza? Um, so to talk about uh, what lessons we've learned, what steps are being taken and whether we need to be doing more and who exactly should be doing it. Um, I'm delighted to be joined by our panel today. Um, I am joined by Sir Simon Stevens, Chief Executive Officer at the NHS, and Dr. Dalroan Haraf also known as Dr. Cham Haraf, um, Executive Medical Director, um, UK and Ireland for MSD. Now, I'm going to start with a few questions and opening remarks, but we are all very much open to uh, viewers sending in their questions. So please um, type them in. I think this is how it functions uh, on the Zoom chat, and then we'll try and get through as many as possible. We have to be off air by 3 p.m. I've been strictly told, so I'm going to adhere to that. Um, and I just thought to begin with, I'm going to just ask both of our panelists just to give us your initial thoughts really on what we've learned from the past you know, six months in terms of coronavirus and what's exposed about our health system. Um, Cham, do you want to go first? Thanks, Katie. Uh, I mean, I think stating the obvious, it's been unprecedented, as we know, and I think from our perspective, it's required a, a global response by the health community. Our sector is a, is a critical part of that health community and, and our uh, uh, overriding, I suppose, enduring response has been to maintain supply of our medicines and vaccines for our patients. Um, the, 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 the output globally also has required us, I suppose, to uh, accelerate some of our uh, efforts on that. I mean, so for example, when I talk about maintaining supply, you know, it has been very, very uh, uh, treacherous. It's been very difficult. And overnight, almost as the pandemic started, we probably had to escalate our manufacturing threefold for certain types of drugs without impacting our normal uh, manufacturing lines. Um, we've also, uh, as part of our response, uh, donated uh, equipment, we've donated PPE, we've also facilitated as an industry our medically trained individuals to be able to go back to the NHS to volunteer and obviously currently now we're working as part of the wider community in trying to find vaccines and treatments to treat COVID-19. Um, I'd also like to say I, th I think, you know, as, we as well as that, uh, much like other organisations, We've also had to focus in, in, in maintaining the safety uh, and, and the well-being of our employees. And I really want to sort of highlight, you know, the, the, the efforts made by especially our employees in manufacturing who from day one, you know, have been doing their job and delivering their job consistently uh, under quite a lot of stress and anxiety. And, and uh, I'm sure Sir Simon will sort of allude. I mean, you know, the NHS is under probably uh, triple that uh, amount of stress. Um, I, I think... MSD, along with the whole sector, are immensely uh, uh, proud and, and admire the NHS for their response. It was rapid, it was fast, and they launched the sort of major incident plan uh, to uh, prep us very quickly to, uh, I suppose, surmount the challenges produced by COVID-19, uh, protecting the public and patients. And I'd say that, you know, one of the, the main things that I'm, I'm really 
proud of uh, on that response is that whilst it's been very stressful, very uh, difficult, uh, you know, we weren't overwhelmed clinically by the COVID-19 challenge. Um, and I think that NHS's ability to flex and adapt to an ever-changing situation, along with the partnerships we've seen between uh, government, NGOs, the industry and other healthcare providers, I, I think uh, it's something to be uh, applauded and be proud of. And going forward with this, I think and it's a key learning that we need to capture that and continue to show resilience in, in and pliability and, and uh, collaborative, have a collaborative approach to ensure that we maintain the momentum and build upon on this. Um, I, I would do say that when you look at our response, though, um, that we do need to find a way of providing equity for all patients. So when we look at the, the situation, we, we know full well that, you know, it has handled the COVID-19 situation from an NHS perspective, but the other therapy areas and other patients in other therapy areas um, have suffered to a large extent, both from a clinical perspective and also from a, a, a mental health perspective. I mean, you know, some examples I'd probably say is back on May the 30th, you know, that uh, there was about 180,000 um, uh, patients waiting for, for tests, endoscopies in particular. And compared to that same time in 2019, that was a 44% increase. And also, if you look through lockdown, you know, there's 2.3 million less uh, tests to diagnose cancer and 76% less referrals for urgent care and almost 60% decrease in, in, in chemotherapy appointments. So, so that has created a, 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 an immediate and important uh, problem for us. I mean, I would like to stress I mean, and point out also that, you know, the NHS was aware of this and did uh, put in, in measures in place to try to accommodate that. I think, you know, the adoption of digital um, telemedicine, for example, uh, the way the MHRA, NICE, moved to produce guidance and guidelines to help healthcare professionals to, to address these issues. Uh, but I think the problem is, is there and we still need to uh, uh, expand on that and, and look, look at how we, we capture ways of improving the patient pathway uh, going forward. Um, the, the other thing I'd, I'd probably say is what COVID-19 has taught us is really that health is, is a key component of economic growth, you know, and, and we must build on that uh, and the learnings of COVID-19 to ensure we support and invest appropriately in science, in clinical research and manufacturing to ensure that we maintain our position as a global leader in bioscience, in, in the life science um, area. Um, and, I, and I think that's very key to ensuring that we are prepared for the next emergency. So as we, we build a sustainable um, response this time around, we, we need to, that investment to ensure that we are prepared for, for the next time. Um, and ultimately, I think, you know, my final word is that we just need to keep collaborating. You know, it's, we have a shared uh, um, objective of protecting the public and patients. And it, it, it's a priority that we work as a healthcare community, especially with the NHS, to deliver that. Um, and I'd probably sort of say, um, uh, paraphrasing uh, some things of George Merck, who founded MSD, um, is, is that if you put the patient first in all our collaborations, I think the solutions that we produce for the patients will eventually, you know, solve the, the wider problem if we go forward. So I think for me, it's collaboration, but it's collaboration ensuring that we are putting the patients at right at the heart of all of this. Simon, what lessons do you think we've learned from the past few months when it comes to the NHS? Well, I agree with an enormous amount of what uh, Chan has just said, so I won't uh, repeat that. I suppose the most important thing is that over the last six months, we have collectively learnt an enormous amount about the way COVID-19 works. So we know now about methods of transmission, much clearer the role that asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic uh, transmission plays. We know that it's not an evenly distributed illness burden across the population, very strongly um, age-related. So um, David uh, Spiegelhalter at Cambridge, for example, has calculated that the risk of dying from coronavirus uh, doubles with every six years of age. Um, if you're a grandmother in your early 90s, then sadly you are 120 times more likely to have died from COVID than your daughter in her early 50s. So there's a strong age component to this. There is a 
strong uh, excess risk associated with um, obesity and other uh, comorbidities. About 40% of uh, patients who are in intensive care in hospitals right now have got a BMI of uh, over uh, 30. Uh, there is a relationship between uh, being from a black, Asian or minority ethnic background. Over a third of patients in intensive care right now are from a, a BAME background. Um, and 70% uh, are male. So we know a lot more about the risk factors as well as the transmission mechanisms. We have some treatments, uh, the leading ones, of course, which have been uh, discovered as a result of randomized controlled trials run very quickly uh, in NHS hospitals uh, across this country, which will benefit not only our patients, but the world. And there is this huge effort underway, as we've just heard from Cham, on uh, vaccine development as well. So we know a lot more and we're able to respond more effectively clinically, but let's not kid ourselves, we are most certainly not out of the woods. Uh, you know, the fact is that the number of COVID hospital patients has more than tripled uh, since the start of this month. Uh, admissions are rising uh, rapidly, particularly in the northwest and the northeast. And so we are going to need continuing vigilance over the coming months. Simon, I just wanted on that. Do you think that we are definitely then seeing a second wave resurgence of the virus? We are certainly seeing that uh, in a number of regions across the country. Uh, in that sense, it is uh, closer to the situation that uh, France and uh, Italy saw in the uh, first their first waves as against our first wave, which was much more broad based across the country as a whole. Uh, but obviously the concern is that uh, if that picks up momentum uh, across the country, then we will see uh, a, with a, a lagged effect between uh, community uh, infections then showing up as hospital emissions, then showing up as intensive care, and then showing up as, uh, as mortality. Now, there's various aspects of this in terms of how we improve our response to coronavirus. Um, but one of the things we often keep hearing, whether it's from uh, the World Health Organization or uh, various figures on the Tory benches, or even uh, the government sometimes is testing, the importance of testing, testing, testing. So I wondered, um, Sham first, if we're looking at, I suppose, ways to increase our testing capacity, which is clearly the something the government uh, very much wants to do. Early on, I think in the initial response, you saw Public Health England uh, really relying on their own uh, capabilities, building their own rather than leaning on the private sector. So do you think that we need to see more collaboration going forward? Um, Cham, do you think we have enough of that already or is, is there still some way to go? So, so I mean, I, I suppose I speak from a point of ignorance of, of not fully knowing what the arrangements are, but what, what talking to colleagues uh, in the NHS and talking to colleagues within sort of testing, I, I suppose, you know, there is room for improvement with that doubt. And I think there is room for improvement, understanding what we're trying to do with the testing, right? So, so I think, first of all, for me, the biggest problem that I've heard is about access. And I, I think also linking up um, the, the tests in terms of how many repeat tests we're doing. So, so an anecdote from Leicester, I think, you know, that, that a lot, some patients were utilised in the testing service, not, sorry, not patients, but the public, in terms of going back to double check whether they, their, 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 their positive test had now become negative. So had they cleared coronavirus? So, so I think, you know, the, and because the system wasn't catching up in terms of understanding that these patients have had a test, it was very difficult to follow what was happening. I think hopefully the app and, and the, the, the increase in digitization of the testing service may address some of those issues. Um, overall, I mean, I, I think uh, for us, the, 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 the testing part now, I think, is, is understanding what the RO is doing. And as Simon sort of said, sort of understanding where, where the phase, phase two of this pandemic is occurring. And, and I think putting that, you know, it, it, it's really to help us do our fast response to mitigate spread to further regions and, and externally. Um, I mean, and, and this is, I think, something that um, uh, Simon probably can comment on is, is what I have heard is there is capacity with NHS trust labs. And I think that the question remains is whilst we've centralised the testing is, should we consider the, the utilising, you know, the, the, the NHS labs also to, to, to take that on? Uh, maybe in areas where we are seeing an RO increase compared to, to other, other regions. But, um, uh, but so I think, I mean, yes, I think there is 
a need for better collaboration. Um, but for me, I, I'd also say that testing is only part of the solution. So, so it, it's a mark of, of our, our, whether our tactics are working. So, so actually getting encompassed and worrying too much about the testing at this stage is, is not, uh, it may divert us from actually finding solutions for other, other issues that are very em, um, evident with COVID-19. Simon, would you, would you accept the criticism we sometimes hear, which is that Public Health England and NHS were too slow to bring in uh, potential labs that could have been used for testing in the early stages of, of the pandemic? Well, I can't really uh, comment specifically on Public Health England, other than that uh, that has uh, now been responded to by the health department who have brought together the Public Health England functions with the new uh, test and trace uh, service which has been established under uh, Baroness uh, Dido Harding and that is obviously a combination then of um, public and private labs including the uh, so-called Pillar 2 labs. The plan that they are working to is a, another huge expansion in testing over the course of the next um, uh, four to five weeks aiming by the end of October to be doing 500,000 uh, tests a day. That's um, partly going to require a further big expansion, a doubling in the uh, number of tests that have been done in uh, NHS hospital labs, as well as uh, PHE and Roche. And certainly from the NHS's point of view, as a user of uh, that uh, test capacity, we definitely uh, would like to see uh, many more tests available, not just for symptomatic testing, but also for asymptomatic, for um, screening uh, type testing of the sort that is happening in uh, care homes right now, but is not available more generally. Now, that will be uh, greatly uh, advanced if we do in fact see some of the further uh, technical breakthroughs that have been widely discussed. Uh, saliva testing, for example, that can potentially be done on a batched basis uh, that would give that kind of scale. But um, there is no doubt that uh, that would uh, be an important part of the uh, defence mechanism that the country has, alongside the fundamental point, however, which is that uh, with this type of infectious disease, uh, the number of social contacts that each of us has uh, is one of the main vectors for um, the uh, upward numbers that we're seeing. And so, you know, whatever the uh, legal framework, uh, ultimately, we, all of us, uh, have to act responsibly, as people have been, uh, in order to keep this thing under control. Yeah, and just just on briefly on test and trace, and I want to talk about um, other things, of course, but I just wanted, to, uh, Simon, to have a little bit of clarity, because often we hear it's NHS test and trace, and then uh, others suggest it's government test and trace. So is test and tra trace NHS, or what, who's is it, ultimately, who's in charge? Well, the NHS uh, certainly uh, benefits enormously from a uh, test and trace. Uh, the test and trace programme under uh, Baroness Harding is actually being run as part of the uh, Department of Health. Uh, the NHS labs are contributing to the uh, testing capacity, but it is a, a, a sort of freestanding service uh, that uh, is, has been established for this uh, pandemic. Okay, so it's a, a government mainly funded. Um, now, Chan, looking at think, and you touched on this in your opening remarks, uh, we have a situation where clearly we're going into what could become a very intense period for hospitals in terms of coronavirus again, though as Simon and, and yourself have discussed, in a way we are better prepared for, for lessons that we have learned. Um, but we already have you know, long waiting lists for cancer treatments, for other treatments, coming up the track. What do you think can be done ultimately if we are now living with coronavirus and also if we look at what the Chancellor said last week, um, it does feel as though we are with this disease for the long haul, we're not expecting to be rid of it anytime soon. So how can the NHS and other health services better um, balance coronavirus focusing treatments with uh, tr treatments which ultimately, without which we could end up in a situation with a very high death toll, so cancer and so forth? I mean, I don't think uh, I or, or, or my sector probably have the, the direct answer to that. I think this is where I think collaboration has to come in and, and, and we have to find our route through. And I, I'd stress that, you know, a bit like with testing, we need to find a sustainable solution. So uh, um, um, it, it's not enough to find something that will get us through the next few months. 
Um, I'd say to approach it though, we do need to, to I think there's a, there's a large piece before we even get on to looking at the patient pathways about reassuring the patients themselves, right? So, so there, there is an immense amount of anxiety I think we can underestimate amongst patients and especially based on the letters that really went out at the beginning of the lockdown, you know, asking people to self-isolate, asking people to shield, that actually th those were generic sort of, I suppose, letters based on a, on a diagnosis and weren't particular to the individual. So, so I, I think we have to address how do we, um, you know, give reassurance and, and also give bespoke advice to individual patients. So is that through... Uh, you know, f further sort of, you know, uh, outpatient telemedicine sort of appointments? Is that through further uh, uh, correspondence? After that, I think then it's actually as NICE uh, uh, started doing, is looking at sort of, I suppose, treatment pathways that minimise the risk in terms of to patients and, and uh, the healthcare professionals. So, you know, sort of, for example, if we talk about cancer therapies, looking for cancer therapies where we know where we have good safety and efficacy data that allow them to be dosed at sort of uh, less frequent intervals and, and therefore the patients can receive treatment. And then ultimately, I think the third part we need to solve for is, is how does all the ancillary services work for? For example, one of the, the, the after effects of COVID-19 is that, you know, ex radiology services are working really well, as, as some will know. However, because of the requirements of COVID-19 in terms of uh, protection of, of patients and health professionals, you know, a, a chest x-ray itself now takes much, much longer. Yeah. Um, and finally, what I'd also say is going back to my point about patients, I think, is that I saw some data also that um, from a, uh, um, so a selection of GP practices that had video uh, capabilities so they could talk to a patient and have a better informed uh, conversation with the patient. However, 76% patients, uh, percent of those patients uh, preferred not to have video on, you know. So I think with all of these things, we do need to keep checking as to what's acceptable by patients and the public um, and not to try to impose a, a solutions that we believe to be best from that perspective. And, and Simon, on that, I mean, you've said uh, how the NHS is preparing a second wave escalation plans, but ultimately uh, trying to enact them as late as possible because you want to make sure that we do get that non-coronavirus care. So how is that balancing process going on? Are you worried about what's happening in terms of cancer wait lists? So we've had a, a window of opportunity, which we are using to the full, to um, expand non-coronavirus related services. Since the start of the pandemic, uh, hospitals have looked after over 111,000 uh, COVID patients who've needed their specialist care. But I think it's worth just noting that even at the height of COVID in April, for every coronavirus patient in hospital, there were two other non-coronavirus patients getting looked after. So although it clearly did have an impact, it's not true that the NHS was ever a COVID-only service. But that said, it has obviously had an impact on care for the reasons that uh, Cham has described. And so the ramp back up is now well underway across the NHS. We are, um, we believe that uh, given uh, this time round, there's more um, certainty as to the type of uh, requirements that coronavirus patients are going to have. Uh, we are not confronted with the situation we were in early March, where, you know, frankly, when you looked at those scenes in hospitals in uh, northern Italy being overrun uh, with patients who weren't able to get uh, care in uh, intensive care, you know, we went from a situation where we had a few hundred coronavirus inpatients uh, in mid-March uh, to 11,000 a fortnight later, and then 18,000 a week after that. Um, you know, the modelling from uh, various of the groups uh, suggested that that could continue to spiral out of control. I think we're, we're much better placed uh, this time round. But the reality is, the inescapable reality, is that if there is a huge upsurge in coronavirus infection in the community, then patients will need uh, inpatient care. But what we are moving heaven and earth to do is to make sure that uh, other services, including uh, cancer care, as we talked about, um, get back on track. During March, April, May, June, July, actually, the NHS was able to offer 85% of the usual level of cancer treatments. 
Some of those were deferred because patients and their clinicians uh, came to the view that it would be more risky to embark on an um, immunosuppressing course of treatment at the time there was so much uh, infection around in the community, some of it because of the uh, capacity constraints that uh, Chan uh, described. Uh, but we really want to try and uh, sustain uh, that full range of other services uh, to the greatest possible extent that we can. Thank you. Um, now, do you send any questions you have, just enter the chat function and we'll try and get through as many as possible in due course. Um, I think, I suppose, looking at uh, the various balancing acts in terms of uh, things that we need to do, uh, services that the NHS has to offer. I just wanted to ask briefly, um, Simon, one of the things that's been in the news a lot is ultimately birthing partners and uh, <coughs> a campaign by the Mail on Sunday at the moment about making that more possible. Now, it depends, it seems to depend what NHS trust you, you're at, depending on whether or not you're allowed to bring someone in with you if you're uh, pregnant and uh, to give birth. So is there any update on that? Is, is more work being done? Because clearly it's something causing quite a lot of uh, anguish. Yeah, I mean, the position throughout uh, the uh, uh, pandemic so far, uh, the national uh, advice to hospitals was that uh, they should always permit uh, birthing partners to be their father's uh, partners uh, during uh, labour and childbirth. But we have um, issued a uh, further reminder to hospitals, the chief midwifery officer, uh, Jackie Dunkley bent and uh, Matthew Jolly, the uh, national clinical director for obstetrics, have written to hospitals reminding them of that and also uh, wherever possible the importance of partners being able to come to uh, antenatal visits uh, for scans, checkups and so on. So we definitely would like to see that right across uh, the maternity units. Katie, can I come in? I've got some personal experience of this because my son was born in August, actually, so I've gone through that process. He's, he's, he's our third child, and I'd, I'd probably say, you know, in, in um, you know, in defence of the NHS, the, the, I think it's obviously a very difficult situation, and I think we found, obviously, you know, the scans. Uh, my, my partner, she had to go by herself, and so forth. So, you know, there was a lot, lot of anxiety, and her and I did reflect that actually the. The levels of anxiety if this was our first child would have been much more heightened and I think this is where also uh, from a healthcare professional perspective that providing a, a solution that maybe one size fits all is probably uh, you know sometimes not the way to go where actually you probably need to spend more time with, with those uh, um, parents that there are uh, <coughs> first time in, in terms of uh, childbirth uh, compared to the you know some of us who are probably about sort of you know third time or second time there and I think it's important that when we approach this and I think um, maternity services are a good example that we do try to still maintain that patient-centric approach in terms of understanding what the patient needs might be so you know it was, it was just a point that I probably throw in because I think it, you know whilst we can get caught up with the pandemic and say look we can't really we need to address it as an urgent matter I think still make, trying to maintain that will alleviate some of these uh, anxieties and misunderstandings, as I'd say. Now, I just want to go to one audience question because it was on a topic that I was hoping to move to, which is ultimately a huge part of the coronavirus response if we're looking at coronavirus specifically is care homes and what happened the last time around, um, working together. So I mentioned earlier the testing being used in care homes. So um, Steph asked what provisions are being made for the care service so we don't send COVID patients into the care system. And I suppose it can also be what provisions should be. I'm not sure who wants to go first on that. I'll let Simon go first on that. Okay, I'll okay, go Simon first. Yeah, um, well, I think the, the questioner is, is quite right. And what we've seen in care homes, not just in this country, but actually in uh, Germany and uh, Scotland and uh, Sweden and a number of other countries is that they have been disproportionately hit by coronavirus. And that's not just explained by the fact that there are a concentration of older people in care homes and there's this strong age uh, curve to um, the risk factor. So I think um, the there are sort of various layers to uh, what is the, the government's response and support for care homes now. First of all, they have been getting um, 
more uh, weekly uh, testing uh, than actually uh, any other part of uh, the country. And that's very important to be able to quickly identify where there are um, outbreaks. Secondly, uh, Matt Hancock has uh, said that uh, he will be making available, continue to make available um, PPE uh, for care homes, uh, together with the training uh, support that they've been getting from the local NHS. Uh, thirdly, it is increasingly clear from the various studies, not just in this country, but internationally, that a lot of the problem with the um, infection outbreaks in care homes was from the movement of staff between care homes and from the community into, into care homes. A uh, set of studies called the Valdi studies, uh, another piece of work from uh, Public Health Wales uh, within the last couple of weeks have all highlighted that. So making sure that um, care homes have got the support so that uh, they've got the staff that they need and they can create these uh, bubbles, if you like, um, to prevent uh, the spread of infection is going to be uh, crucially important. And then there's a very important role as well for local authorities uh, in ensuring that there are appropriate isolation or quarantine uh, periods uh, for people coming into care homes um, as they uh, as you get movement of people, residents uh, in different parts of the, the care system. So I think all of those are laid out. Uh, the the uh, Department of Health uh, published uh, what uh, they called their uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, winter plan for adult social care uh, on the 18th of September, and it's all set out in there. And uh, as just for go to Chen for his thoughts on this, I just wondered, one of the things that you often hear in the debate around coronavirus is this idea that we should be shielding, not all, you know, segmenting parts of the population um, so the idea being if you look at scenes right now where we have lots of students uh, trapped in their halls and um, not having the best freshers week I think it's fair to say um, lots of people saying well actually why why is that happening why don't we take uh, more elderly groups groups higher at risk and close them off I just wanted Simon do, do you think when you're looking that is something that you think would be viable the prime minister said that he didn't think it would work and Chris Whitty has said similar well, I mean, I think there's a nuanced answer to that, isn't there? I mean, yeah. clearly, um, if you are, uh, you know, my parents uh, need to take particular care, and and indeed, and indeed they are. Um, so that's part of the reason why there was the identification of people who were uh, clinically extremely vulnerable and older groups uh, first time round, uh, with particular uh, protections uh, for them. Um, However, that is not the same as saying that by itself that is a strategy that can succeed. And indeed, even if you look at the um, way in which uh, infections are uh, spreading across uh, the northwest of England right now, you can see them beginning to ripple up the age curve. So the idea that you could uh, you know, completely uh, separate uh, the fifth of the population who are aged over 65, say, I think is implausible not least because uh, for some of the most vulnerable, they will be getting help from working age adults, some of whom will be younger and some of whom will be living in households with younger people and so forth. So, um, you know, that's just not the way uh, the world works. And in any event, there would be legitimate concern about the social isolation uh, that, you know, is giving rise, for example, to this very understandable discussion about whether there should you know, how much visiting you can do in care homes, for example. So um, I think uh, that in a nutshell, um, extra precautions for those at greatest risk is clearly a sensible part of the, the mix, uh, but by itself, we're not going to have age-based apartheid across this country. Chem, uh, what are your thoughts on that? I, 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 I've got I, 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 lots of questions coming yeah, in, I'll just say quickly. I, so, uh, I, I, lots I don't of... much to that. I mean, I, I, I totally yeah. agree with what Simon said, I think pretty eloquently, because the novel thing about coronavirus is the fact that most of us, you know, will have a very asymptomatic disease or very few symptoms, right? But it, there is a percentage of us, a very small percentage, age-related and potentially some other markers that will have a very negative outcome. And I think this, this goes back to the point that we make, that we all need to be working together and be vigilant. Your pandemic response is only as good as your weakest aspect, you know, so, so therefore, you know, we can't uh, create sort of, as, 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 as Simon put it, in apartheid for the elderly uh, population members. I think you have to uh, approach it from an overall population. And it's all, you know, it, it is all our duty to, to ensure that we take precautions. 
Um, quite a few questions coming in. So if you do have any more questions, do get them in ASAP so we have time to get to you. Um, here's one, I, I think we'll go to the, you first from this chat, which is from Jane Patricia Hodge. Post coronavirus, will there be a new balance of NHS and private partnerships? Um, I, I hope so. So, so I, and I'll say, say, say it from that point of view, not, not from a, a production point of view, but I think what COVID-19 has allowed us to do is we've, I suppose, had to break down sort of mistrust that might have existed in, in, in places. And for me, I think we are demonstrating that collaboration is possible. We are also demonstrating that even when it comes to treatments, for example, that we can move faster on uh, deciding about new treatment pathways and so forth. And, and for me, um, the simple answer is that we need to maintain that, 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 that level of trust we're building up, maintain the dialogue, especially in terms of where we are. And then uh, going ahead, I, I, I think, uh, without doubt, I, I think it is required. Um, and I think the, the other, the impending, I suppose, requirement is, is, is the fact of, of, of other potential emergencies and other pandemics. So, it, I mean, I, I'd like to be optimistic but, and say there won't be any, but I, th I think the reality of it is there will be, you know. Simon, do you have anything to add on that before we go to more questions? Well, I would just underline two, two things, perhaps. Uh, the first is that the NHS, one of the things we've done very uh, quickly when uh, coronavirus kicked off, was a partnership with independent hospitals, uh, independent uh, diagnostics companies uh, across England, and have been able to ensure that uh, NHS patients are there able to get access to those services. That's a partnership that we expect to continue and we'll be uh, re-procuring, we're in the process of re-procuring uh, right now. So certainly no, uh, no impediments there whatsoever. And the second thing I would just underline is uh, Chan's point about um, research for in the life sciences sector and actually you know there was a piece in the uh, New York Times a few weeks ago uh, that was headlined uh, uh, where is America's groundbreaking COVID-19 research the US could learn a lot from Britain uh, I think that uh, you know speaks uh, volumes about the way in which we have had this uh, very agile response to uh, research treatments and uh, vaccine uh, development in this country and uh, long may it continue. Now I do want to talk a bit about future pandemics but I just want to get a few more audience questions in first so Natalie asks what is the biggest failure of this pandemic? Um, who, who would like to take that? Um, I, I mean I, I actually I actually do think that that question um, we need more time to answer that question. I, the reason I say that is not to sort of deflect the, uh, an answer but is that we are in the middle of phase two, right? Uh, and, and throughout the globe, uh, there is resurgence of COVID-19. And I don't think anyone has a sustainable model to take us forward uh, into, into the future years in terms of how do we um, combat COVID-19. And the likelihood is it will become endemic in the human population and become a se potentially a seasonal virus. Uh, I mean, that's yet to be determined. So therefore, I think um, understanding, you know, uh, the learnings, the true learnings in terms of clinical aspects and the government government response, I think has to be done when we're in a in a, in a phase where we are, uh, you know, I suppose plateaued out in terms of where we're going forward. So, so I, I'd rather say that at this stage, it's really focusing on on what needs to be done going forward, and um, and. Later, I think that there there has to be a look at how we how we uh, approach this. I mean, for example, I mean, I think we do need to look at um, have a you know generate data on 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 the people that sadly died during this, and see if there clinically was anything more we could have done in terms of 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 you know um, uh, treatments and in terms of the pathway that we initiated. I mean, um, and I, and I think it's really important that a lot of that is done from a, the perspective of learning as opposed to uh, pointing fingers and I've been accurate because I think, as I said, right, it's unprecedented, right? So we, whilst we've known that a pandemic is potentially coming, I think the reality of the pandemic has taken all, us, all of us by surprise, you know? Um, I think very early, much, much earlier when, this, when it started in Wuhan, I also thought that maybe we'll have herd immunity and this will be, you know, something that when a certain percent of the population have had COVID, then the problem would, would uh, abate itself and it hasn't. Um, 
<laughs> so, so, but, but I would say, I mean, I, th I think if, if I was pushed, you know, one of the key things is uh, we'd have to look at is, did we close borders fast enough? And I think when you look at uh, the, the couple of countries that have, have had lower rates of infection than that, uh, they, they, the common theme seems to be um, that they, they close their borders very quickly, you know, so when, when, when WHO sort of um, called this a pandemic. Simon, what do you think is the biggest failure of the pandemic in terms of the handling? Well, I think fundamentally, the reason we will have ended up with um, the uh, deaths that we have had is because we had much more coronavirus circulating in the community in February and March than was known about at the time. And that in part is uh, because of the absence of uh, testing. Uh, it is partly that the uh, case definition that originally attributed uh, coronavirus type symptoms to being coronavirus if you had a travel history uh, from Wuhan or China or uh, when actually uh, some of the genetic uh, testing of the uh, coronavirus has shown that uh, much more of it came from uh, France and Italy uh, across our borders rather than uh, originating in China. But fundamentally, it's that we ended up in a situation where, as the Office of National Statistics have estimated, I think seven out of 10 of the working age uh, adult uh, uh, coronavirus deaths occurred um, before uh, early March, uh, infection before early early March, uh, before, before lockdown. So that, mm -hmm. that I think, will turn out to have been a crucial period. Now, one question here from Draghi, which is, what support should large pharmaceutical companies uh, be giving to the NHS while we wait for a vaccine? Chan, what do you think of that? So, so, um, I think, number one, uh, I know our focus has to be um, not only doing research for vaccines, but research for other treatments potentially for COVID-19. So, so identifying, I, I think, also in, in medicines that we've already uh, produced, uh, potential candidates that might be working. And I think dexamethasone, you know, is a, is a classic example where, you know, MSD, we launched that in 1950. And, and I'm glad that it's still, you know, sort of as a clinical utility and has been around. From, from my perspective, that um, the, the, and then beyond that, I think is, is going to what, what Simon describes is as the NHS makes solutions in terms of the patient pathway, you know, improving diagnosis of other things, improving um, uh, I, I suppose treatment pathways is working with the NHS to implement th those new new pathways and techniques so there's a lot I think I think we can do as a health community to to work together I mean the, the, the answer won't really come from just pharmaceutical companies um, working with the NHS it has to be a collaborative approach from diagnostics to uh, to, to uh, also I suppose one group we haven't really spoke about is, is, is charities and, and, and you know, especially healthcare charities where um, the support of the patient, I think, for me is paramount. I think going forward also, um, when we're looking at this, the, um, uh, uh, the, how fast we actually get sort of innovative treatments through is a key question. I mean, I, I think the, the, the regulatory authorities have, uh, you know, bent over backwards, I suppose, to in this sort of acute phase to try to improve that and try to get access to um, you know supply chain medicines from elsewhere but i think as we look forward we need we do need to look at how quickly we can go through once we get gain a license to to introducing uh, new innovative medicines into, into the patient pathway Simon, what are your thoughts on this? You've mentioned, I mean, not directly related, but in the past, you know, criticised those drug firms which try and price gouge the taxpayers. So what positive role can be played? Well, that's a that's a very unusual particular circumstance I think you're referring yeah, to, yeah, sure. which is one particular uh, company that has yeah. uh, taken some uh, generic uh, lithium off brand and uh, attempted to hike the price by 2,600%. Uh, uh, from three pounds twenty-two to seventy-seven pounds. So, but that is the absolute exception rather than the rule. Uh, the the reality is actually we have a very constructive and vibrant partnership with uh, research-based uh, uh, life sciences companies. And so, I mean, in terms of the research priorities, um, we obviously want more treatments for uh, those who are um, acutely and severely unwell with COVID, building on what we've had with uh, dexamethasone and uh, hydrocortisone. We've got remdesivir there. There are trials underway on uh, convalescent uh, plasma. There are two uh, monoclonal antibodies uh, that are being uh, researched here as well. 
and there is some recent uh, research just been published in the journal Science uh, looking at whether there are um, genetic or uh, immunological uh, defects that explain why certain patients go on to have a worse uh, coronavirus uh, experience uh, clinically that if we could get to the bottom of could be very helpful as well. So look, there's a, there's a, a huge amount to be done here um, and that's before we get on to the vaccine uh, question and I hope that the sort of improved clock speed from uh, regulators and uh, life sciences companies and NHS trialists that we've seen over the last six months can become the new normal uh, forever, not just something that we do uh, in these terrible times. Now, I think it might be quite hard to think about this, but when we're looking ahead to a potentially second wave, or we are, at least as I'm saying, some parts of the country are seeing that second wave of coronavirus to think about what the next one is. But when you read uh, various views of scientists, there is a sense among some that this is not actually the big pandemic. There will be more to come, and actually they could become more frequent. So I wondered, given that the Gates Foundation estimates that a global flu pandemic, if it hit now, could lead to 33 million, um, Dad, what what should we be doing now? Can we start to think about what the next pandemic is, or actually, is it something where that just it isn't the capacity? Um, I'm not sure who would like to go first on that. Uh, I, I don't mind going first. About I think going back to that question about what we could have done better. I, I, you know, when I qualified back in '96, um, the discussion of pandemics was going on, on on then, and I think then maybe we were actually perversely sort of, it was more of an intellectual debate and saying, you know, is it avian flu, is it SARS and so forth. What I think has caught us by surprise is we weren't prepared for this, right? We weren't prepared for understanding potentially where it could come from. I think we lulled ourselves into a false sense of security that with influenza, we at least had vaccines uh, to treat influenza. And therefore, you know, we felt that was the biggest threat uh, in terms of pandemic. And we, we had an armament that could, could help uh, combat that. And I, and I think, you know, the, the, there are multiple factors that are pushing other viruses and, and potentially other bacteria to, to become pandemic uh, creating um, uh, things. So, so if I give you an example, I think, you know, with, with uh, potentially climate change, we're seeing certain diseases spread wider across, across um, different territories. So, um, and I think, you know, this is, you know, Ebola was a classic example where we were seeing Ebola break out far more often. And I think, you know, that's also a great success story for vaccines in terms of having created uh, vaccines on that. But things like dengue, which is another virus um, um, uh, which infects sort of in, in, into people's blood. Um, historically, I mean, when I was, when I qualified, it was, it was in about four, endemic in about four or five countries. It's endemic in over a hundred countries now. And that potentially is the, 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 the mosquito that sort of transmits it, having a wider range. Same with Lyme disease in, in the UK. I mean, when I, again, I might make myself sound like a really old person, but when I go back to, to, to you know, when I was quite a friend, there's very few cases. It was a rare, rare diagnosis. And now it's a more frequent diagnosis. So I, th I think when we think about where this is coming from, the solution should not only be um, based on looking at, you know, viruses and, and saying what it is. I think there's a greater societal um, factors we need to take into account, not at least climate change, you know, so, so, so it, it will come and, and that's a sad fact of it, but we, we need a, a total response in terms of combating it, not just looking for new vaccines, not looking at new sort of uh, pa pandemic techniques. Simon, what would you add to that? Because we clearly heard a lot about how the NHS and the UK government had a strategy for a pandemic. It just in the end, it turned out that the pandemic we got was not the one that matched that strategy. Yeah, I mean, that's right. Uh, so obviously pandemic flu had been right at the top of uh, sort of worldwide concern. There have been three flu pandemics in the 20th century. People think back to the 1918-19 uh, so-called Spanish flu uh, pandemic that I think killed perhaps around 40 million uh, people. And then there was the Asian flu outbreak of 1957 uh, and then the so-called Hong Kong flu 1968. So uh, you know, people very concerned about flu given the way in which the um, uh, subtypes uh, can evolve and uh, spread around the world. But I think, uh, as uh, Chen has just said, there are many other infectious disease threats that aren't uh, influenza. And 
you know, in the 1950s, um, infectious diseases were a sort of dying medical specialty. Uh, now, quite obviously, uh, they are front and center, not least given the interaction with some of the other science that's been done around immunology and uh, uh, genomics. So what, 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 what do we need to sort of uh, be aware of? Well, I think the first thing is uh, the risk is going up as a result of environmentally driven changes in the interaction between uh, animals and humans. And a lot of these um, originate um, in animals and then uh, spill over uh, and then compound that with the global interconnectedness that uh, we have, which has always been a feature, by the way, of uh, pandemics um, spreading along trade routes. That's what happened uh, with the uh, plague, uh, the three plagues uh, that we've, uh, pandemics we've had in the last uh, 2000 years. So first and foremost, we need a strong surveillance uh, infrastructure globally. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I think uh, the British government's done a very smart thing by um, looking to uh, strengthen the uh, way in which WHO works in this area. Prime Minister has announced uh, extra uh, WHO funding uh, no doubt there'll be a discussion to be had about how uh, that uh, works uh, with the proper reach into uh, every individual individual country. And then over and above uh, the surveillance, over and above the uh, tackling of the root causes of some of these uh, uh, likely uh, risks, then we're just going to have to um, be uh, investing sensibly in some of the vaccines and other uh, treatment responses, because I think um, if you think about the economic damage that has been done by uh, COVID, the cost of that relative to the cost of pandemic preparedness, uh, I think people will now see that uh, pandemic preparedness is a very smart buy for not just this country, but for the world. Yeah, do, do you think we are gonna see much more investment then in pandemic preparedness in the future to expect? Um, I do. Yes, I think uh, people will uh, understand. I mean, even if you think about the you know, economic consequences of the last six months in this country relative to some of the uh, uh, sort of health and, uh, and public health uh, costs, uh, if, if by investing smartly, you can offset some of that uh, significant economic damage, then that would constitute a very smart buy. And I just want to just on that briefly, Simon, and then I want to get to the final question, really, is do you worry at all about obviously the cost of social distancing, the cost of lockdown? There's obviously the cost in terms of non-COVID deaths, but just the cost and the drain on the economy that it's going to be, we might get to a point where it's hard to sustain the level of funding we currently have in the NHS if the economy shrinks. Yes, I mean, this is obviously a huge concern, not just in this country, but in all countries that have been affected. Uh, you know, the fact is that the NHS uh, depends on a vibrant uh, UK economy. Um, I've sort of said previously that uh, when the uh, British economy uh, sneezes, the NHS catches a cold. Um, so, yes, this is, uh, this is very important, but I think it cuts both ways. I think the NHS is going to be uh, part of some of the levelling up economic agenda that we're going to be seeing over the next uh, five or ten years, whether that's uh, the... Uh, beneficial consequences of investment in uh, R&D that we've been talking about, whether it's the uh, jobs that are going to be created through the uh, construction sector for the uh, 40 new hospitals that we need to see across the country, uh, whether it's the opportunity for uh, high skill jobs uh, that uh, the uh, health and indeed social care uh, sectors represent. So you know, we are um, both reliant on and a contributor to British economic success. Um, now, just final questions coming up the track because uh, we have four minutes, so probably too late to add in. Uh, one question that, which we've had from a few people is ultimately about we're talking about social distancing, and Sam, you said it's one of the most effective ways to live with coronavirus, to limit the spread. Testing is obviously also a key part of that. But yet, there's been some really quite, um, I suppose, depressing figures in terms of the current level of uptake, the number of people who are isolating. Um, do, do, I wonder from both of you, I mean, do you think, I mean, we can prepare all the extra space in the NHS there is, but is it ultimately, a, it seems like quite a big problem if you cannot get currently, you know, public adherence to go much above 20% on some of these things. Uh, so Simon, do you want to go first? I mean, uh, uh, yeah, sure. Well, 
actually, if you think about how people responded during the uh, sort of initial phases, people were incredibly uh, responsible and they looked out for their neighbours and their, uh, as well as their friends, friends and relatives. People uh, volunteered. Um, there was a huge sense that uh, we're all in this uh, together. Um, understandably, uh, some months on, uh, we you know forget uh, aspects of that, but or I think those of us in the health service would say is we're not doing this for the government. We're not doing this because a law has been passed. We're doing it for ourselves and each other. And so it's that sense of um, uh, personal and uh, shared responsibility that is uh, ultimately going to get us through this. And ultimately we, we, we have not beaten the pandemic yet or the virus itself yet. So we're all still personal accountable to supporting efforts to get there. Um, and it's very difficult to say when that end point will be. Um, and moreover, I think that when you talk about, we talk about COVID-19 isolation, but the, the more endemic it is in, in the population, the more complications you will have in other disease areas. So for, for me, you know, it's not just about um, whether I'll catch COVID or not. I think by, by using social distancing, by taking care, it is protecting the health of, 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 of a nation, not just, just about an infection rate uh, of COVID-19. And I would also just say, Katie, just the other thing on this is this is not just about, um, you know, I'm uh, y- young and immortal uh, yeah. in my 20s. Um, you know, unfortunately, the fact is we are learning more about so-called long COVID, about the ongoing consequences that affect people where they get multi-organ uh, disease on the back of the initial infection so this is you know this is an infection that needs to be taken uh, very seriously uh, and the consequences are not just for other people but they can unpredictably strike yeah and long covid is something that younger age groups need to worry about too yes and yeah. um, now final question um, ultimately this discussion is titled the nhs in a covid 19 world and i think one thing a few people are asking is how long is this going to be a covid 19 world uh, we, we have a situation where boris johnson talked about six months more restrictions uh, pointing to either a vaccine or operation moonshot which is a mass rapid testing i wonder just to end but for both of you i mean how, how do you how long do you think this is going to be a world where we are living with coronavirus where coronavirus is dramatically uh, ch- affecting and changing the health service that we need um and uh, chan do you want to go first and then we'll end with simon all i could say is i think i think it's going to be for a very long time uh, and I, I you know we are working tirelessly to look for vaccines and other treatments but that, that is some way still in the future. And I don't believe that we will have a one vaccine solution that, you know, there's, uh, uh, you know, data coming through that Simon's alluded to that means that the immunogenicity of, of COVID-19 may mean that vaccines may not be the total solution. So, so hence, we, we just have to make what we're doing currently sustainable and, and something that is looking ahead to the future that allows us to uh, live with the threat of COVID-19 going forward. And, and, and and re- resurrect our daily life in, w- w- alongside that. Um, so so I, I would say you know what it's 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 a sort of depressing note to end on. Um, you know we, we should just assume it's here for that. And I would say that other coronaviruses you know are endemic in in, in the population. So so COVID nineteen is not the only beta coronavirus that has got itself into the human population and then become endemic. Thankfully, the other ones do, do cause very light disease. Simon, you get the final word. Well, like uh, like Chan, I think uh, it's quite likely that at the sort of population on the global level, uh, COVID-19 will be around for um, a long time. But I'm perhaps a little more optimistic that um, at the back end of this year, the first part of next, we will begin to see vaccines that will make a difference to people's uh, risk profile. Uh, that together with uh, some of the wider uh, mass testing uh, technologies, uh, will, I think, uh, mean that we can be much more um, targeted and selective uh, in the responses uh, that are being taken. And finally, I would say that as far as the health service is concerned, I mean, our message to patients, uh, which we've been trying to emphasise uh, over the last uh, several months, is not, uh, you know, stay away, come what may. Our message is, uh, we are here, we are open, help us help you. And the way in which you help 
us help you is by coming forward and getting that uh, concerning lump checked out or if you've got chest pain, uh, your heart problem. And we are open and let's make sure that we sustain as much of that interaction as we possibly can, even as we head into winter, possible further spikes in COVID. Brilliant. Thank you so much to the, my panel today. It's been a really interesting discussion. I'm sorry we couldn't get to every question that was sent in. Um, too high demand, which is never a bad thing. Um, so thanks again, and thank you to MSD for sponsoring this discussion. I'm now going to leave it there and exit the meeting. Um, so thanks again, everyone. <laughs>